Good morning and welcome to our services here at the Eupora Church of Christ. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, I am truly honored for that. I'm, I'm thankful that in the situation that we're in and us having to be online only, uh, that, that you are tuning in with us today. So I hope you've all had a good weekend and I hope you're now ready as I am this morning to study the Word of God. Last week we talked about a very uh, somber and humbling reality when it comes to the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That reality that speaks volumes is that there was no room for Jesus. There, there wasn't any. People didn't want him. Herod wanted him dead. So the people rejected him. They rejected his ministry. And they looked for an opportunity to get rid of him. The truly sad part with all of this is that they failed to see that our Lord, the, the one they want to get rid of, the one they've wanted dead, the same baby that's laid in the manger, he came for them. He came for us. And they didn't fail to, they failed to see that. Because hanging on a cross with death imminent, Jesus prayed to the Father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, our prayer, if that was you or I, our prayer would be very different. I'm speculating for you, of course. My prayer, I'll say that. My prayer would be very different. But even though the world rejected Jesus, Jesus willingly laid down his life for them. After all, the very reason that our Lord Jesus came was to bring new life, give new hope, and a new future to all people. There's an old saying that you live and you die by the choices that you make. If you don't believe me, just look at some of the choices that you've made in buying your spouse an anniversary gift. I've had some doozies. I've not been brave enough, as some of them I've heard, to buy your wife a mop for anniversary or for a birthday gift. I haven't been that brave. Uh, we've been married over a decade now, and I've not gotten that brave. But the saying says, you live and you die by the choices you make. But I want you to understand something. The choices that you make in your life, well, they have consequences. They all do. They have consequences. They could be good or they could be bad. God gives you this freedom to choose the route that you want to take in your life. So today I want you to understand something very important uh, about this vapor of a life that we have, this temporary existence in the flesh. And that's that our lives are the culmination of those choices that we've made along the way. When was the last time you stopped and thought about that for just a moment? Our lives are the culmination of the choices that we have made along the way. So this morning, as Christmas is just around the corner, I want you to think about a certain question. And this question is important. I believe, I believe utterly important. But it's a question that we find in the Bible. It's a deep question, and I hope it provokes some real thought in your mind. Not only for a holiday that comes once per year, like Christmas does, but something that you know lasts in you always. So turn with me now in your Bible to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 is a text I believe we're all very familiar with. At this point in Scripture, Judas has betrayed Jesus. We've had the mockery of the trials that were the Jewish trials, the three Jewish trials. And now Jesus, our Lord, innocent man, has been taking it, taken into Roman custody. So our Lord is standing there before the Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate, an evil, wicked man in his own rights. Not a whole lot good we can say about Pontius Pilate. But even he knows that our Lord is an innocent man. He recognizes that. He can sense that. He knows it's a charade that stems from the evil hearts of the Jewish leaders. He, he can sense that. After all, they've wanted to get rid of Jesus his entire life. But Pilate asked this question. Matthew 27, verse 22. 
Pilate says to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And the crowd that he asked that question to yelled back to him, Let him be crucified. So I want you to understand the importance of this question as we get into our lesson today, especially as we get into the holidays and all of this thought that should be present every day now becomes on Jesus, something that, again, we should be thinking about daily. Jesus, from our very first lesson as we got into this month, Jesus is Emmanuel. That, that means, Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus was born of a virgin in a town of Bethlehem. The Bible, long before his birth, told us that. For approximately 33 years, Jesus Christ walked in the flesh, being tempted, being tested, just as you and I are, only he did it flawlessly. The same, <laughs> the same could not be said for us. Not even close. Now we fast forward to this moment of his life. A moment that we're in because of hatred. Because of spite. And we find this question. What shall I do with Jesus? What shall I do with Jesus? Pilate sets two choices before the people there, before the Jews. An evil man by the name of Barabbas. A man that deserves punishment. A man that deserves the cross. In reality, a man that represents the world in a quite beautifully fashion. It's a very fitting choice. Barabbas versus Jesus, because that's still us today. Same choice. But beside Barabbas, Pilate places the Lord. And just as the world had done ever since the birth of Jesus Christ, when he was placed in that manger, they rejected him and chose Barabbas to walk free. What will you do with Jesus? You hear this saying that we need to put Christ back in Christmas. I've heard it every Christmas as long as I can remember. But do you even know what that means? Or does it just sound catchy? See, I pray you all remember the reason for the season. But what is the reason? What was the outcome of the birth of Christ? And most importantly, what was the purpose? Why did he come? Because when Pilate asked the Jews this question, what shall I do with Jesus? They shouted, crucify him, crucify him. In verse 25, the Jews even go on to say, his blood be upon our heads and on our children's head. I'm guessing the children didn't have much of a say in that. But we stop and think, how could they make such a choice? How could they reject the Savior? Don't you get it, my friends? We do that every single day. We make our choices just as they did. Why do you think we need a saying like, put Christ back in Christmas? Why do we even need that? Because we've taken Christ out of the holiday. We've taken Christ out of our Christian walk and many people who would dub the name Christian have taken Christ out of their hearts altogether. Understand something. That makes us an awful lot like the Jews standing before Pilate shouting, we want Barabbas, not Jesus. That makes us very similar. Was man's response to the coming Messiah, the rejection of, of the coming Messiah, was that a surprise to the Father? Remember, God is omniscient. Omniscient means God knows all things. God knows everything. So was it a surprise to the Lord when Christ came, took on flesh, and the people said, we don't want it? What if it were you? Would you come to seek and save the lost, as Christ did, knowing what the response of an ungrateful people would be? No, I would say not. We would likely say, well, give them what they have coming to them. Hellfire and brimstone, God, make it another Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, that would be our approach. What would we do with Jesus? 
So I'd like to take you back to our scripture reading for a moment. And again, thanks to Claude for doing such a great job when he, uh, in our scripture reading. This will be our main text for the day. I'm going to add a couple of verses to the beginning of it because I want you to see a point Christ is making as to why the people are rejecting him. So John chapter 12, like I said, from our scripture reading that Claude did, we're going to back up to verse 42, and I want you to read with me John 12, 42 through 48. John chapter 12, verse 42 through 48. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. What Jesus does in these passages is is something incredible. He's basically summarizing his teachings throughout the gospel so far. He's really putting this bow on it here for us of what he has gone through. And he even backs up and he tells us the problem. The Lord was rejected by these people. The people didn't outwardly express their faith in Jesus because worldly men love worldly praise more. They cared more about that than Jesus, than praising God. That meant more to them. I'm glad that's not something we deal with today, is it? See, someone refusing to accept Christ because of worldly desires? That doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? (laughs) It sounds like a normal Sunday to me. But to my point here, I want you to notice what Jesus said. He said, I came as a light into the world to judge the world for the wicked ways. We're going to destroy them all and cast them into hell. Again, probably what we would have done. But I want you to notice the true blessing that we have here. Because our focus has been on this is Jesus so far this month. And Jesus said he came for a purpose, born of a virgin in a smelly stable, meant for animals, placed in a manger, meant for feed, rejected by people that he came to save and nailed to a cross, meant for criminals. This is Jesus, the greatest name there is. This is him. So now back up to Pilate's question. His question before the mob of Jews. Because Pilate's response to the whole situation of this trial was inadequate. The Jewish leader's response to Jesus' ministry was irresponsible. The mob standing before the governor shouting, We want an evil murderer, Barabbas, to go free. That's irrational. But regardless of all of that, we are left with a powerful question. What shall I do with Jesus? And it's interesting that he asked that question because Pilate held the very powers of life or death in his hands at that moment. Now, we could get into a much deeper study that it's Christ that laid his life down. But in this moment, in a general sense, Pilate held these. Luke tells us three times that Pilate has professed the innocence of Jesus by saying, I find no fault in him. It didn't matter. The Jews wanted him dead. And if you were curious, there's still a very popular opinion in that today. If Jesus were simply out of the picture, wouldn't everything be well and good? If Jesus was nothing more than a nativity scene in a front yard, but there was no depth to it, there was no real following of Jesus to it, well, that would be okay. 
So I want you to think about a couple of things as we go throughout our remainder of this lesson today. First off, I want you to notice that what we do with Jesus to answer Pilate's question, what we do with Jesus depends on what we think of Jesus. Now, I've had baptism conversations with people before, some people that were expressing some interest in being baptized, but it was clear that they didn't understand who Jesus really is. People say, he's a good person. Some say, well, I want to be baptized. Well, tell me who Jesus is. What baptism would feel good? Others say, well, he's the one that died on the cross. You know what? All of those are true. But there's so much more to him than that. So what else do you think of him? What, what could we say and how we think of Christ and professing who Christ is because of what Christ did for us? So you turn over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, Paul wrote to the disciples there in Rome, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation." So for many people, the choice is simple. No, it's not making Jesus the king over their lives. That would be the profession of faith that Paul is writing about. Their choice is to reject the Savior as those in Jerusalem did. Go right along with the mob. A good acronym for mob is a mass of betrayers. Mass of betrayers. And most people would fit right in. There's a quote I like. It was an unnamed quote, but it says this. Sometimes the majority only means that all of the fools are on the same side. Hear that again. Sometimes the majority only means that all of the fools are on the same side. Well, the majority of people today are rejecting Jesus and walking contrary to his teaching, to his ministry, to his gospel. Those outside the church reject Jesus and who he is. They reject what he did. They reject the purpose behind why he did it and how he did it. They don't see him as the prophesied Messiah. They don't see him as Emmanuel. They don't see him as the Savior on the cross. In fact, there are many that would view Jesus as a fraud. Those are people outside the church. What about inside the church? How do we view Jesus? Now, many, I believe, are sincere. But I would easily say not all. Their rejection of the Lord is much more subtle, however, than those that are outside the church. It's not as straightforward. Instead of outright challenging who Christ is and what Christ wants for them, because that would make it clear, they simply choose to ignore Jesus, ignore his teachings, ignore his ministry altogether. And I guess they chose to ignore John 14, verse 15, because in that verse, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, there are some that would say they love Jesus, but I don't want to keep his commandments. So this is the true litmus test for all that put on that badge, Christian, what will you do with Jesus? Because Jesus Christ, he is the great dividing line. What you do with Jesus determines who you are and more importantly, whose you are. That choice determines much of our lives. The choice determines friends, family relationships. That choice is a life and death choice. That choice is a destination choice of heaven or hell. Life is the culmination of the choices that you and I have made along the way. And these choices have very serious consequences. I go back to the quote I read a few moments ago. And I want you to visualize something for just a moment. Uh, Miss Paulette shared on Facebook 
uh, this week an image that really caught my attention. It, it's an image that I have used many times in sermons, but it speaks such volumes. And it shows a person walking towards Christ alone. The minority going, or the majority, excuse me, going away from Christ. And see, I pray that your faith is never rooted in the opinions of the majority. I pray that you have the courage to choose Christ, to walk the path that leads to Christ, even if you walk the path alone. And that you're willing to walk that path alone because you understand why it is that you're willing to do that because you know who Jesus is. That he is emphatically the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's Jesus. But finally, what we do with Jesus depends on how we view our future. Simply put, it depends on what we are living for. For many people, it's simply living for here and now. Well, what would they have left when the here and the now is gone? You know, we're coming into the holiday season, and this is a great time that we have normally. I know COVID's put a damper on a lot of things, but this would be a great time that we have to celebrate as family and spend time together. But I want you to think about how many people are celebrating the holiday this year missing someone very close to them. I know several that are. My friends, please understand this. That will be us someday. Tomorrow is not promised. I really believe that one of our big issues when it comes to faith is that we always assume tomorrow is going to come. There are people who are going to die today thinking tomorrow is going to come. Galatians 4, Paul wrote that Jesus came in the fullness of time. I was really going to expand on that, but being remote, I'm trying to keep the lesson short, but I wanted to look at that a little bit. Jesus came in the fullness of time when he was not received well, he wasn't expected, and guess what? He's coming again. We don't know. We don't have this grip on time like we think we do. So our time could end today. And so we'll either meet the Lord in the sky when he comes and time comes to an end altogether, or you will meet Jesus when death comes calling. It can be a meeting filled with hope and grace or with doom and destruction. Jesus said he came as a light into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world. But he taught us something very important. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. The time for saving will be over at that point. See, your view of the judgment scene is going to depend solely upon the choices you made in your life and the choice you make here. That ties back to our question. What did you do with Jesus? How did you view Jesus? Was it a baby in a manger and nothing more? No no substance to go along with the Savior? Or is it with the reality and the understanding of who Jesus is? What will you do with Jesus? We're going to take the Lord's Supper here in just a moment to commemorate the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. A great blessing and opportunity that we have that we partake of every week. We're going to do that in just a moment. But before we do, I want to leave you with this in closing today. What will you choose to do with Jesus today, every day, is your choice. It's only your choice. No one else can make it for you. Parents, you can't make it for your children. Children, you can't make it for your parents. Friends, you can't make it for your other friends. There are many that will attempt to influence the decision. And as a Christian, I would strongly encourage you to do that, to help encourage someone else. But the choice stands with a person that has to make the choice because that person has to answer for that choice. 
But the choice isn't really complicated, in my opinion, because there are only two. We can follow after the Lord and we can worship Him knowing who He is, the one that loved you enough to take on flesh, to be placed in that lowly manger, the one that loved you enough to choose to live a humble life, the one that was rejected and persecuted, but ultimately the one that chose you. You can choose Jesus, or you can choose Barabbas. And everything Barabbas uh, represents, the world, uh, the, the fame of men, all of the things the world represents, you can choose the wide path filled with the majority because that's the easy path. That's the path that most people are going on. But that's the path that is headed straight towards destruction. My friends, I, I can't express the importance of this enough. It's only Jesus that saves. It's only Jesus that's the way. And it's only Jesus that holds the keys to heaven and to hell. Rejecting him means you will die in your sins. And those sins, you will answer for so for my last time this morning, I want to ask you this question. What will you do with Jesus? In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus is described as the one that loves you and that washes you from your sin, not with some special water, not with some secret sauce, no. He washes you from your sins with his blood. That's what Jesus did for you. That's why I, as a Christian, am willing to walk that road by myself. I pray you are as well. If we at the Uport Church of Christ can help you with this choice, please let us know. We would love to study with you. Uh, we would love to help you with the steps of salvation, if that's your choice. And I know there are a lot of very loving people that would be more than happy to pray for you if you're in need of that as well. My only encouragement for you today is that you don't wait. I, want, I, I, I pray so diligently that you remember Jesus, not just in a season, not just on a holiday. Remember what he did for you. Remember who he is, the life that he took on, the flesh that he took on, and the death that he suffered because that cross was meant for us. But he took your place. This is Jesus. That's what he did for you. Thank you all again for being with me this morning. I certainly appreciate it. We're going to have one more song, uh, and then we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. So uh, hang with me for just a little bit, and we're going to get to um, commemorate the Lord's Supper, the great blessing that we have in getting to do so. Thank you all once again. God bless you all. Bye.